welcome to Varm Blog. And today we're talking with Daniel Besner, um, a co-host of the American Prestige podcast, a podcast of international affairs, um, author for an upcoming book for Zero Books, professor of international studies, international relations, which one? Uh, international studies, international studies. International studies and uh, a bunch of other stuff, including a contributing editor to Jacobin. So um, today we're going to be talking about uh, imperial realism. I'm trying to get a feel for the concept, um, how liberal imperialism may be changing under the Biden administration, and maybe how you think the left should respond to it. Um, so just a basic question. You've gone over it before in other interviews, but what is imperial realism? Uh, well, obviously, it's of course, it's a riff on Fisher, right? First and foremost, capitalist realism. Uh, so I just want to make the obvious even more obvious by stating it. So, you know, Fisher had this whole idea building on theorists, particularly, in my opinion, Frederick Jameson, about uh, the notion that, that one can't even... Um, exist outside of a capitalism uh, and actually exist in capitalism, even in one's imagination. Uh, I think it's a, it's a line from Jameson, something along the lines of it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. And, and someone like Fisher explores the functioning of that basic idea, that basic notion in his essay. I mean, he, he takes in new directions, but to be schematic about it. And, and so that just, you know, as I was, um, just looking around the world, as it were, particularly as I was reviewing uh, the video game Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War for the new magazine, uh, The Drift, uh, it struck me that a similar thing is happening in terms of American imperialism, where, where even people recognize its um, its significant problems, the destruction that it caused in the world, the, the sort of reallocation of resources that it necessarily causes at home, the... Uh, <laughs> weak connection at best between well uh, domestic well-being and uh, U.S. imperial action in the world, uh, that even though this stuff is recognized, particularly after um, the Afghanistan and Iraq wars, the Libyan intervention, the uh, the war on terror as a whole, the sort of randomness of, of Trump foreign policy, et cetera, that even though this is recognized as a reality, it's difficult for people to imagine a way out of it. So uh, the essay that I'm writing will hopefully explore um, this, the uh, connections between these various processes and how they uh, exist in the world. So what do you think are some common misunderstandings of imperialism that are shared by the left? Most of the left, I'm not going to say all of it, but most of it does see itself as anti-imperialist in some way. And yet analysis seems to be thin. Um, so what misconceptions do you think there are? Well, I mean, uh, it's very difficult to be, you know, an anti-imperialist with a plan. I mean, take someone like Noam Chomsky, someone extremely important and extremely influential um, and, and has a pretty solid understanding of U.S. foreign affairs, influenced by uh, the Wisconsin School of New Left Historians, in particular, like William Appleman Williams and Gabriel Calco. But, you know, Chomsky has a great critique of U.S. foreign affairs, but he really has no plan with what to do with that critique. And, and, and that's for a variety of reasons. And I think most importantly, uh, since the United States' uh, rise to world hegemony in, in, in and after World War II, uh, a particular form of state was created that it's just very difficult to influence. Um, I think uh, the, the state is almost totally, totally disconnected from the democratic will, certainly in terms of the public or public opinion, but also I, I would add in terms of Congress to a large degree. Um, famously, of course, the United States has not officially been at war since 1942. Um, and I think that, you know, there's no clear plan of action. There's also very little connection, in my opinion, both in, in empirically um, and historically, uh, empirically today and, and historically in history, between, you know, grassroots movement activism and transformations in U.S. foreign policy. Um, I'd say you could, you could say that that had an effect during Vietnam. Um, I'm a bit skeptical of that claim because I think the largest – impacts of the anti-war movement were the the uh, inauguration of a not the inauguration that's not fair the ramping up of bombing campaigns in cambodia laos and north vietnam uh and the uh, ending of the draft you know the establishment of an all-volunteer draft was essentially removing the bourgeoisie from uh harm's way as opposed to making it genuinely anti-war um and so there just isn't really a, a direct mechanism of action i also think you see at least in my opinion some sort of naive um, associate, I'm not, uh, Varn, I don't know what you think about this, so correct me if you think I'm wrong, but um, some sort of naive 
uh, aligning oneself with, uh, for example, the, the the People's Republic of China as an anti-imperialist force. And, and I agree, the People's Republic of China is certainly anti-American, but I wouldn't necessarily describe it as an anti-imperial imperialist force or, or basically a force for human liberation. Uh, all that being said, I don't think there should be any confrontation between the United States and China. But I see that unlike the left, since we're talking mm -hmm. about the left, sort of naive you know, kind of enemy of my enemy is my friend type situation. Um, and that leads to what I would say is kind of like a fantasy politics about, you know, uh, in, imperialism writ large. You know, yeah, it, it, I feel similarly. I've, I've done a lot of looking at where China is in its international developmental regime compared to the United States in the 20s, the 30s and the 60s and now. And there are patterns that are similar and there are patterns that are slightly different. Um, and it does seem like a lot of people project upon China a lot of what they want to see there. And actually, it's not even just the left. On the far right, the very far right, you see it too. Yep. Um, and so, you know, um, however, I, I also find that hard to talk about right now, given that the U.S. imperial apparatus has amped up anti-China rhetoric in such a degree that, you know, sometimes it feels like saying the, some things that are, to me, transparently obvious about what's going on would say like China and Africa becomes harder to say because of the high, the hyperbolic nature in which we see right. like US that people talk that, about China. That leads mm -hmm. me to two things. Uh, one, don't worry, no one's listening to the left. And two, <laughs> um, it does raise an interesting strategic question um about you know whether it's it, it, for the for the left to have a seat at the table does one have to while again being totally anti-new cold war anti-confrontation with china does it does it make sense to acknowledge that china is not an anti-imperialist force at least being invited to the table to me that's a strategic question because mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter what the left says frankly um but it's interesting you know that that's essentially the game of politics is a game of not being morally pure and so you have to choose your your moments when to not be morally pure and that's something in general the quote-unquote left which i mean what are we really referring to <laughs> college right. people online uh are really into because they're college educated people online and they really like having pure moral politics which fair enough uh, don't we all but yeah we are probably also have to distinguish what we mean by the left well, it, it's it's interesting on these points. Um, you you may not know this about me. I come from a I, I actually come from paleo conservative background, and while I do tend to be very hesitant on any kind of four way into left paleo conservative unity on anything within the nation state within the U.S., um, their foreign policy reporting is often quite good. Um, and ours often seems to be, for lack of a better word, copium. Um, so why do you think that is? Because not like paleocons are any less marginal than a lot of the left is. Um, well, I mean, there is a, a, a much longer standing tradition of American skepticism of international affairs that's linked to effectively racism and xenophobia and nationalism, mm -hmm. right? Going back to the pre-Republican period and especially in the early republican after so there's just a longer tradition of that than there is of a genuinely left-wing um politics which doesn't really exist in the united states and never really existed in the united states uh it's sort of first of all there were elements of it but i mean the american labor movement when compared to its north atlantic uh nor nor north atlantic i don't know colleagues um, has always been to the right, uh, and that's partially due to the fact that, that Marxian socialism was never a particularly powerful indigenous force. There's not even a, really a Fabian socialism as a particularly f a powerful force, Lasallian socialism. The United States has its own Debsian tradition of socialism linked to populism and things like that, which, which is important. But I think that the, the United States, basically due to the access of free land, was always able to be more conservative in its labor movement because you were always able to use the escape valve of land to the West for white men to to basically prevent the organization of a, a powerful, avowed Marxist, um, you know, super powerful Marxist movement in the cities, even though there were at times, you know, very between 1880 and 1920, the height of labor, some some various, you know, powerful constituencies um, available. There's just that lack of strong tradition does not go back to the founding like paleo conservatism does, paleo conservatism does, and it's like Pat Buchanan. You know, guys, which is the only one that's been effective in the last 30 or so years.
Uh, yeah, I, I would agree with that. There, there is a a longer tradition of um, of right foreign policy skepticism that does go all the way back to the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist debates. So, one thing I would I would I think you you bring an interesting point is you know I I want to counter you by talking about Debs's anti-war support and how popular he was. Yeah, yeah, twelve percent in the nineteen twelve election. Yeah, there was. Um, it's a pr particular American form of socialism that the American state squashed in World War One. But I was about to say, I think the disproof to my own point is how fast it was recuperated by by um, Wilson. I mean, if it was really, really strong without Debs, it would not have been recuperated as a Democratic Party within one election cycle, which it was. Um, well, World War One, generally speaking, I, I mean, me and a couple of friends talk about this all the time. In some sense, World War One was the end, right? Like mm. the, the thing that was supposed to happen didn't happen, which was that the workers of Europe weren't supposed to fight each other. And once the workers of Europe fought each other, you get basically a, a hundred year crisis of Marxism, which we're still living in. And every every post-1914 response to Marxism from Gramsci to the Frankfurt School to like whatever post-Marxist theorists, they're just living in the shadow of the failure of World War One. You know, that was a big deal when the SPD did it. In, in Germany and created the, uh, the the USPD and it was a big deal in, in the US, et cetera, et cetera. So my macro historical perspective is that we're in terms of socialist, if one is going to make historical uh, delineations based on left politics, World War One, 1914 is the is the really the end point when things went the wrong way. I um, I tend to agree, actually. It's, 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 it's something that I don't say a lot out loud because it makes everyone mad because everyone has their date where things go wrong and few people want to put it before 1917. But also Marx's predictions about economics start going wildly off kilter after World War I. Well, I so, mean, the, the, the thing with World War I, I mean, according to Marx, it, was, it has to happen in the industrialized West. Right, that's the whole point. <laughs> uh, and so, when it happens in the Soviet Union, uh, you know, Russia, the collapsing imperial, uh, the empire of Russia, um, it's a different thing. You know, I mean, I, I have beyond my problems with the way the Soviets approach things, but it's just not what Marx, you know, mm -hmm. Marxism, Leninism. You need the Leninism for a reason. <laughs> um, in in that light, I mean, um. <laughs> I think it's easy for some people to think that you're saying that uh, that the left was defeated, uh, you know, 100 to 110 years ago, and and everything else is prologue. But what should, if the left was going to have a seat at the table, and that's a big if. Um, last night I was talking to Dr. Jean Bajalon. I think you know him. Um, uh, yeah, if I know you know him. Um, <laughs> Um, about the DSA's delegations recently, you know, to Peru, to Venezuela. Um, and we both came away with, well, it's probably not doing anything bad, but I don't know that it's doing anything at all. It's um, orthogonal, I would say. Stuff like that is or orthogonal. Some might even say my most pessimistic moments. Uh, I'm not sure that I'll always want to abide by this. I mean, the whole DSA thing might be orthogonal to everything, right? To me capital or whom, whomever you want to you know, like capital is a very broad term let's just use it now uh has reshaped labor relations to prevent the social relations on, upon which any kind of left necessarily relies right that to me is the number one thing dsa might have some effect at the margins blah 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 but it's ultimately an elite driven affair uh and and, and ultimately i would say from my understanding that that left-wing politics or whatever we call socialism is essentially contained in the in, in the social class of the, what people have called the professional managerial class, what some might call the knowledge workers of the bourgeoisie, whatever, whatever have you, which is fine. You know, those people are very important. They're powerful. And I think that you could see some sort of um, change at the level where those people, uh, you know, basically downwardly mobile elites are able to affect things. But that has nothing to do with, you know, a broad based socialist movement of the, of the kind that left wing politics has traditionally relied on. Now, the question the the fact of the matter may be is that 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 is no longer possible. Right. In, in, in the face of totally and utter defeat where labor relations uh, of, of, of the gig economy have essentially uh, made it very difficult, not impossible, but very difficult to um, to build coherent organization on the ground um, that the best we, we may hope for might be DSA uh, envoys visiting Peru or whatever the case may be. I, I forget the country you named. But yeah, no, I mean, it's a moment of incredible weakness, uh, in my opinion. Uh, and that's the starting point of things. So to pivot a little bit, um, 
I think a lot of people have viewed, and by this I mean broader than the marginal left, but what we might call colloquially in America the liberal left, like the the broad, not Republican sphere, um, have viewed the Biden administration as being a little disregardingly aggressive on China, but in general, a step in the right direction, unquote. I tend to think that you are hyper skeptical of that. Would you like to articulate why? I'm hyper skeptical of basically becoming more aggressive toward China. Oh yeah. Or well, n no, no, no. I mean, there's that too. Oh, but hyper skeptical here. of like of the Biden administration being being a step away from our 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 a our a, a slightly amping down of U.S. imperial policy. Oh, no, they're just making a, a more stable hegemony. Mm -hmm. uh, my understanding of what the United States is doing under Biden is that they're drawing down in the Middle East. Uh, they're trying to refocus energies on preventing uh, China from being hegemonic in, in broadly East Asia. Um, and the purposes of that has nothing to do with drawing down U.S. imperialism, just about stabilizing American hegemony. Um, Biden has no desire to draw back the empire. I mean, we might see some vague structural changes, but even that uh, I'm doubtful of, given that he asked for an increase in the defense budget. So I don't know. I don't. I don't even know who's argued that, but I'm very skeptical about what they would point to. I mean, I guess the decline of uh, of Middle Eastern action, but that was always. I mean, that was you know, as they used to say during Vietnam, a brush fire war. Right. That never that, that was never a threat to American hegemony uh, in any way, shape or form. The structure is totally in in uh, intact, in my opinion. So um, now that I put that kind of straw man up, if we look at what's actually going on with NATO right now, um, what are the tr trends that we're generally seeing? And also, um, I think maybe people interpret uh, stabilizing hegemony with the with with the fact that the U.S. can't act totally unilaterally anymore due to counterpower from um, Russia and to some degree China. China is actually a lot more quiet on things than people realize, except in regards to its its, its uh, own sphere of influence in Asia. Um, um, what do we see changing internationally in the international order as as U.S. Economic power as slowly, I mean, it is dying down. I mean, it's not at fifty percent of the world, right? Uh, still, way. I mean, that was a unique circumstance where the industrialized world committed suicide. I right. mean, that's not going to happen again. Um, but it's still pretty goddamn big. Uh, so I would say, like, relative decline in from a ridiculous position of strength is not really that. The, the, it's not really in decline. Like I'm, I'm very skeptical of the whole America's decline argument. I think you could have an absolutely, totally powerful, um, particularly in the age of nuclear weapons and dollar hegemony, but really in the age of nuclear weapons, a, a totally powerful uh, imperial structure with domestic breakdown. You know, I think that we might see something like on the, on the along the lines of that, where American society continues to be torn apart domestically. Like that, there really are things. But mm. the empire has been effectively removed from democratic control. It's kind of like the Fed. What the Fed is like fourteen year terms, like like someone like who's gonna control the the empire, right? It's gonna be the generals and the and the bureaucracy. Uh, and I don't think see that uh, power being challenged anytime. And that was by design. You know, when they created the thing in the forties and the fifties, they did it on purpose. Super successful. <laughs> we can learn um, a thing. <laughs> so one thing I think that, that's interesting is um there have been I guess some some people who get broadly called post leftists, it's not a flattering term, but they do, who have argued that Trump was a kind of a threat to empire as well. I mean, he just um, wasn't empirically. I, I don't know what that argument would be. He just right, didn't. right. Like his, his facts on the ground didn't happen. That's what I would say to that. He did have a rhetoric. He did he did demonstrate that you could criticize the Iraq War on the right, and there's no consequences for that. But he just governed like any other American imperialist. And you could argue that there are reasons for that. Maybe the military was against it and like blah, 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 whatever. Trump didn't have the political will. So I think it'd be bizarre to claim that he's an anti-imperialist in any meaningful sense. One, one thing I would uh, point out that maybe you can speak more on is how independent the military has truly seemed of political structures, particularly after Trump making it obvious. Um do you agree with that assessment? And why do you think that is? I, I was thinking about, for example, how um, George Herbert Rocker Bush was able to invoke the Insurrection Act against a smaller thing than the Freud uh, 
uh, the George Floyd uh, rebellion protest, whatever you want to call it, um, in regards to the LA riots, whereas Trump could not do that easily um, from the military's own guidance um, now. And what do you think that says about the independence of the military and how that's changed? Well, just with the larger thing, America is just less white. So that mm -hmm. sort of like extremely obvious racist action is, I just think, less possible just because the facts on the ground are different than they were in 1992. So there, that's, a, that's a big change. That's an enormous shift in American politics, um, particularly the elite spheres have, have been, I mean, as everyone knows, you know, the anti-racism stuff has totally permeated the elite sphere. And so that's that's true of the military. There, particularly the officers are also come from an elite, so they're affected by the elite of the rest of society as well. You could think of it that way. So that, there's that one element too. Um, since the creation of the all volunteer force, the bourgeoisie has just less interest in controlling the military. Uh, you're just not as affected. Uh, the bourgeoisie is just not as affected um, during Afghanistan and uh, the second Iraq war as it was during uh, Vietnam. Just fact on the ground, right? So how many people know people uh, in the elite or even the downward really mobile elite who, who were, you know, killed in the war or, or injured in the war who have PTSD? Very few. So that mm -hmm. just leaves them uh, totally separate. And then you just have the institutional structure of things like the Joint Chiefs of Staff, things like Mattis being appointed DOD, things like um, other military officers being appointed throughout the establishment where they're basically given a, a, a functionally independent voice in, in the policymaking structure. So it's a multi-causal, but it's, uh, I think, a, a, a resulted, as you suggested, in an independent military. Um, I guess this also leads me to, to ask, why has the military been able to maintain its relative popularity to all other U.S. political institutions? Um, guilt. People are guilty <laughs> of sending it to fight. I mean, honestly, because it, it, in terms of like actual things, in terms of like VA benefits, it's not good. In terms of people who have PTSA, it's not good. It's also not good to be sent to fight wars in Af Afghanistan and Iraq, right? It, I think it's mostly bullshit cultural stuff that people feel guilty. <laughs> Again, the the consuming middle class. I mean, where where are those things felt? Like at airports? What is an airport? It's a space of the bourgeoisie, you know, or like going to the front of a line. That that's basically where you see it. Thank you for your service. It's meaningless cultural mm -hmm. nonsense, in my opinion. All right. Um, so if people wanted to understand what's actually going on in U.S. foreign policy, where would they look at and what would you tell them to focus on? What biases should they read against? They should only listen to the American Prestige podcast debuting <laughs> this Friday. Um, I, honestly, I think the best source on foreign uh, news right now is my friend Derek, who I'm actually co-hosting the podcast with. His newsletter, Foreign Exchanges. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really excellent international news. Derek does an enormous amount of work, um, and I would trust him more than anyone else. I mean, you still get good reporting in the, the those major major places, um, the Times, The Intercept, The Wapo. Uh, you know, sometimes they'll have good investigative reporting, mm -hmm. but uh, particularly for for the Times and places like that, you have to always view it through the prism of they ultimately believe in things like American hegemony and American armed dominance and. You know, blah 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 blah. Everyone knows. <laughs> yeah, and and they also are pretty partisan about how they believe in it. But, um, okay. So, to go back to imperialist realism for a second, one of the things I think that that it implies is one of the first steps to dealing with imperialism is accepting that a lot of anti-imperialism is not just facile, but it may be even part of the imperial apparatus. Um, how, how do you think people can come to terms with that in a useful way? Uh, could you be a bit specific about what you mean? Well, I mean, for example, um, the Democratic Party and, and, and kind of the boomers, for example, use the anti-war myth of the 60s as a legitimation form for basically, you know, two generations now they have been able to use it. And yet... If you actually look at um, opinion polls for the times, uh, the general, you know, people who fought in World War II and and Korea were actually more likely to be anti the Vietnam War than young people were, statistically speaking. Um, and yet, that image of those street protests and stuff seemed to give a political narrative some validity. So, like that, that's it's a, it was a kind of anti-imperialist, anti-war sentiment. I, I have no reason to believe it wasn't sincere, 
but it seems to actually ultimately be used to put a gloss on what are basically imperialist policies by one side of you know the apparatus in the united states yeah i think that's a that's accurate um i i i mean i think it's just the, the myth like you suggest it's it's the myth of the 60s it's uh the myth of the boomer protests blah 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 and i mean that that narrative will become less and less powerful as boomers pass from the scene which they will really start to do in the next it's going to happen quickly in the next five eight ten years i think a, a lot of these these myths will go away i don't think that's one that's going to last uh you know i don't think we'll be talking about that in 100 years as a height of anti-war activism um what do you think the what do you think we should have learned from the anti-war activism of the aughts <laughs> um <laughs> that the, that the democratic party is not a space for anti-war activism that it that that it that it it was it, it was really about partisanship more than anyone anything else um that it was it was in opposition to george w bush more than it was in opposition to war uh and i think that became pretty clear uh, uh incredibly quickly both with obama's policies and also the the total dissolution of the anti-war movement in 2008 2009 um, yeah, I remember being somewhat shocked by the, the few sincere anti-war liberals, such as, I guess, Gary Wills over at uh, the New York Review of Books, who seemed to not listen to what Obama said in his campaign, because um, he didn't even lie about it. Like, one war bad, one war good, and then when he amped up Afghanistan, everyone was like, but you're anti-war. And, and even at the time, I remember going, that's not what he said. Like, he said repeatedly that Af Afghanistan. Well, he, what he would do is he would repeatedly call Iraq uh, a dumb war, mm -hmm. uh, implying that the war on terror slash Afghanistan were smart wars. Uh, I mean, he said that repeatedly. He made no. I mean, you can't blame Obama for that. He 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 said that throughout. Um, why do you think so many people who were sincere drunk their own Kool Aid on that? Um, they wanted to believe. Basically, I mean, it's that like, uh, I don't know if people saw the trial of the Chicago seven, but uh, Sasha Baron Cohen at some point says like they're good institutions just run by bad people. I mean, that's like the liberal thing. The institutions are good. It's the people who run it are bad. And that's what they wanted to believe. The Aaron Sorkinization of politics. Um, yeah, it just I mean, Aaron Sorkin is, is, is interesting because he is the embodiment of that liberal approach to things. Uh, that and I mean he's a great writer too, <laughs> but yeah he is a uh, uh, a a this the personification of liberal ideology. Um, I've recently have been thinking about left responses to the Israeli election as well as the uh, the you know near intifada we had about a, a month and a half back, um, and I remember a lot of the left. Um, kind of reporting naively that this this ousting of Netanyahu was somehow somehow a sign of of an increase in Palestinian sentiment and having to get some people on air to explain that that was nonsense but why do you th um, um what do you think is driving the left being unable to understand you know, Israeli politics or European politics, which is often think, misread too. I would say two things. One, people again, people want to believe, yeah, and like fair enough. It's 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 rough to go through life like super cynical and super pessimistic. We we only get one of these, so fine with that. And another thing is that politics is mostly experienced as consumption. I mean, it's mostly experienced as consumption on social media, and so that contributes to you know uh, what I would call. <laughs> anti-political or apolitical let's just say a strategic thinking it's about to, to just analyze the power the, the power dynamics of, of what's actually going on what is the material relationship um between the united states and israel or what's going on in israel, uh, on israel itself and and I, I think that you know the peculiar peculiar structure of social media uh mitigates against that sort of strategic thinking uh the history of the left mitigates against that sort of strategic thinking the lack of organization uh mitigates against that sort of strategic thinking so i mean i guess generally we just need to think more strategically in every issue area all right um I, one of the things i've seen come up a lot in the more general you know, news about what's going on in Afghanistan, for example, is the somewhat predictable and would have been predictable for the past 20 years, resurgence of the Taliban. Um, 
when people ask me what can be done to fix the situation, I tend to tell them nothing. And why do you think people have such a hard time hearing that? Um, I mean, that seems to me obvious. Uh, uh, I mean, nation building is a failed project, except when it comes at the end of two world wars and years of occupation. Uh, I think that that has been pretty much the history of the last 75 years. Uh, so I would just point them to that. <laughs> uh, read about the history of these things. Um, yeah, I mean, Afghanistan was never going to be whatever people pretended that it was going to be. And, and the, 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 you know, the Soviet invasion in 79 to 89 demonstrates that. And 88 or 89, sorry if I get that date wrong, guys. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was just never going to be a thing. Uh, so it's not a surprise. And I, at some point, if people aren't going to want to look at the history, there's only so much one could do for them. One thing I think is coming up increasingly when we talk about this is that all these things have a much longer history than I, than the bandwidth of a lot of the current left, a lot of the general public, too. Um, I often feel like whenever I'm talking about anything in the 21st century, I have to at least go back to World War I, if not even before that. Um, how do you communicate a causal chain like that to people? Because it seems infinitely complex. I think uh, you, you have to tell stories. People understand things through stories. So you have to have a compelling narrative about the past and why things occurred as they did. And it's not really more complicated than that. I mean, the difficult thing is coming up with a compelling story um, that speaks to people within uh, the cultural uh, world in which they live or, or what Gramsci would refer to. Yeah, you, you have to come up with a way to win hegemonically. I, I, one of the problems, of course, is that uh, the left for, for decades, for a century, was a subculture. And, and subcultures have peculiar pathologies, mostly organized around not being mainstream. So that's a thing, a tension that one sees on the left constantly. And that's one of the things that prevents the left from uh, building hegemony in the Gramscian sense. Um, I suppose another, another thing that, that has been hinted at is neither one of us think the workers' movement currently actually exists, despite uh, a, like a 1% uptick in interest in unions. Um, how do you think that affects understanding of foreign policy? Well, a couple of things. I think that in the United States for a long time, class is not experienced in the same way it's experienced in other North Atlantic countries, which I think are the relevant comparisons. So there's always been a weak class consciousness in this country um, for a long time, even during the era, I, I would argue, at the height of unions. People, there was some class consciousness, but it wasn't what it was in Germany, where people were like literally, you know, reading Marx or whatever, whatever it may be. Um, so, so that's been an issue uh, for a long time. Um, the question, though, is how one goes about building that that sort of recognition of oneself as part of a class, and it's it, it's it's very difficult. And if I had that, I mean, that's a sixty-four thousand dollar question. Uh, and if I had an answer for that, uh, you know, things would things would be a lot better than they are now. But I I don't, uh, and I think no one really does. And I think that's that's pretty clear with sort of. I don't want to name names or name events, but like the, the sort of post Bernie descent into basically meaningless symbolic politics, vicious symbolic politics is a reflection of that. No one really knows what to do. Uh, and so we see it reflected in, in, in cultural stuff like that. It does seem like every time that we have a moment of opportunity for something like a reemergence of a workers movement, when it doesn't happen, we have another culture war. I mean, it's just, it, like you can almost look at the last 150 years and just plot it. Um, yeah, I mean, because what are you going to do when you're out of power in a sense? Um, I suppose um, to, to pivot back to some other stuff that we talked about in the beginning, um, how do you think it, this, this ever presence of imperialism um, manifest in most people's day-to-day -day life. Because even, like I said, when people are anti-imperialist, they can't really get out of it or not be used by it. So in what ways does it show up in, say, the average person who's not a weirdo on the internet's life? I mean, just everywhere in culture, you know, the, the valorization of, of sort of uh, American dominance, the, the various flyovers of football games, you know, the, 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 the thanking of the troops, which I'm, I'm not against, you know, thanking people, 
who, who suffered for various reasons, but sort of the ambient militarism that just defines American life. Um, there's a million examples of it, uh, flags everywhere, things along, uh, along those lines. I, I think what I would point to is that. So, um, over at the Quincy Institute, I, I'm trying to remember if Andrew Basevich still works there, but one of my first introductions to understanding foreign policy again, actually did not come from me being on the left. It came from me working with uh, working indirectly. I never worked for them. Um, antiwar.com and the and the paleoconservative anti-war movement in the aughts. That's where I was at. And um, I found Basevich to be one of the figures that I could still present to um, leftists and get them to understand things without them immediately rejecting other parts of the agenda because the, 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 there's no obvious xenophobia in Basevich in the way there is in, say, Pat Buchanan. Um, would, do you do you find his writings useful? I'm, I kind of put you in a spot because I guess you're indirectly working with him if he's still at the Quincy Institute, but... Yeah, no, I mean, I like I like Basevich. Um, I've always liked him. I mean, I think he, he and I don't think he would disagree with this, he's, he's taken a turn to popular writing and mm -hmm. I think that's very important work in the last, you know, post, basically post Iraq, and, and and he does great at that. And yeah, he's a he's a fantastic writer, uh, and a great historian, and a great thinker. Um, how would one of the things I will say as far as like the the critics of of American international, uh, well, lack of internationalism, American imperialism, do tend to be from the military itself. Often they actually know how it works, um, or at least adjacent to it. Um, now, I don't think left left opposition to people who are former military is as high as it as you hear about in the in the sixties and seventies before I was I alive. Say one thing that that mm -hmm. that that is mostly fake. There's a it's book fake called, too. Mm -hmm. It's a there's a book called The Spitting Image, uh, you know, about soldiers quote unquote being spat on. It's mostly a myth. Um, I, I encourage people to take uh, you know to take a look at that book. Uh, it's by NYU Press. I forget who the author is. Let me look. Jerry Lembka or Lembke. Uh, so check that out if you want that. So that's mostly a boomer myth too. Is the the anti the anti so the anti post soldier sentiment? Yep, um, that's a bullshit. Um, but so um, one of the things I, I have trouble with getting a lot of people who are former military to engage with the left is not so much um, that they even disagree with their values necessarily, at least on, at least on international issues, they might on national ones, um, but that they find the left to be incompetent. And so why speak to them? Um, how, how do you bridge that? <laughs> that I don't know, but that's a funny, a funny, uh, a funny worry. Uh, they're not wrong. Um, I, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, my, I imagine the most effective way to meet veterans is from other veterans. Mm -hmm. uh, would be my guess. You know, again, social relations, um, solidarity, uh, shared experience, uh, things like that. Well, I mean, one of the things that comes to my mind is like I come from an area that your your two ways out of the area were to hope to get into an OK state school or to go into a military. So everyone I know knows, you know, knows military, has military in their family. Um, there is also the generational military and the poverty draft in that area. But because, you know, military Keynesianism is a, is a thing and that basically supported the region I lived in. It was pretty much the only thing that supported the region I lived in. It was like that in Geico. Um, where, where was it? Central, central Georgia. Yeah. If you're, if I think it's, if you're in the shadow of a military base, you're like way more likely to join the military, uh, in the, and particularly in the South and the mountain West. I, I believe those are the statistics. Um, yeah, I mean, in the South, some of it actually is part of post civil war policy. I mean, just like, you know, the, the British sticking a bunch of military bases in Scotland, but, um, the, I, I, it was. It's interesting because when I go and talk to, say, a bunch of Brooklynites in the DSA, they do not know soldiers. I mean, not not unilaterally. Yes, somebody knows somebody because it. You know, particularly in in the aughts, it was a there was a lot of people in the army, but not in the same way that we often do in in areas that are less white, less um, affluent, and. Yeah, that's what the all volunteer force was supposed to do, and it did it. Are you in Brooklyn now? 
No, I'm in I'm in Utah, so I still don't, you know I just don't deal with Vulcanites. But when people I talk to are out of the Bay of New York, it's like consistent all the time. Yeah, yeah, um, there's connection. Yeah, why would there be? <laughs> um, well. I think it's inter- I think that's actually an interesting maybe something to talk about one of the successes of imperialism on is prior to um, World War one and definitely prior to World War two um, the rural or urban divide around military issues and left right economic issues didn't exist in the same way it does after World War two um, there's probably a bajillion reasons for that, but, but it does seem like when you're reading about populist and socialist mayors in like Nebraska, Kansas, and even Georgia. Yeah. Um, urbanization. I mean, just the, the process of urbanization that occurred over the 20th century is probably one of the biggest shifts in human history at all. Um, so that, that's what I would attribute that to mostly. And, and urbanization comes along with a, with a whole host of things and you, and, and, uh, you know, the, the dissolution of a particular types of politics and rise of another form of politics um, is what I would attribute that mostly to. Um, if you were if you were telling leftists what to watch in as far as international developments right now and where things may get legitly hot, um, while I am somewhat skeptical of, a, of another big war on the horizon, because I really don't see the U.S. having the capacity for it, um, the... Where would you tell them to watch? What what would you tell people to watch right now, as far India. as uh, India? India. Um, I think that uh, India, Varn, are we here? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I think that um, India, China, Pakistan is a particularly vi- um, uh, it's one vital to international affairs, but a particularly um, volatile region um, right now. Uh, that's where that's where I would look. Um, I think the India-China tension and to some degree the China-Russia tension are, are, are misunderstood. I know people don't think there is a China-Russia tension. Um, but do you think that comes from them viewing the world totally through American hegemonic glass? I mean, this is kind of a loaded question, but through American hegemonic glasses that they can't see the, the, the flashpoints that don't involve the U.S.? Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably true of, of most people on Earth. They're, they're preoccupied with the various historical filters that they understand. You know, I imagine that, uh, well, the U.S. is so uniquely powerful. Everyone kind of has to be concerned with what the United States is doing. But it's ni- in 1900, I imagine that the French weren't as concerned with what the Americans were doing, the British, blah, 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 blah. I mean, I think there's a, a nationalism uh, and, you know, focus on, on oneself and one's own community that is almost natural to human experience. So it's not that surprising that they're not uh, aware of what's going on in India, China, or between Russia and China, I would say. All right. And to, and to start to pivot us towards the, the end of this conversation, um, your uh, um, somewhat colleague at, uh, at Jacobin Ben Burgess has asked me to ask you um, about the Slimer Muncher debate, which um, <laughs> is an article that I am just looking, uh, I was like, what is that? So I, I um, so uh, this is an article you co-wrote with uh, Chrisman and, and Frost, um, uh, Matt Chrisman and Amber, uh, Amber Frost, uh, or Amber Ailey, I don't know what she goes by now. Um, and Amber Ailey Frost. Amber Ailey Frost, so just be, give everybody the name they want. Um, uh, what do you think the changes in, in cultural artifacts say about the changes in American attitude? And, and why do you think we should care about these cultural detritus at all? Well, I mean, why you should care, that's between you and your maker. I, I can't I can't appreciate <laughs> that. Uh, I mean, culture does affect the world. Uh, it does shape how people understand things. I, 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 don't, I don't think pure materialism is the be-all and end-all of, of human existence. Um, uh, as 1914 showed, uh, but but yeah, I mean, I think that one could one could uh, derive the, the zeitgeist or the spirit of the times from cultural artifacts. And what what struck us about uh, the Muncher thing, and obviously, of course, the movie hasn't come out, 
um, so you know things might be completely different, though I doubt it. Was that um, it was such a stark, almost jokingly so, a, a jokingly stark contrast between sort of the the hedonic hedonic nihilism of Slimer, as opposed to you know the 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 the, the sort of sloth focus of, of muncher as sort of like slimer is like seizing life uh and, and taking everything that he can take out of it and muncher sort of you know going through life in 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 quite a different way and i i think that that probably says something about why the ghostbusters are are uh the, the two ghostbusters sort of the original and the, and the preview that that wasn't the ghostbusters starring all female leads are so different um and i think that um you could actually get uh a, a meaning from these sorts of comparative analyses. Um, I suppose that that does can that takes us full circle back around to imperialist realism because one thing that that we can see uh, historically, I mean, you can look at France for an example. Of this is imperial mel uh, melancholia doesn't actually mean that the empire is going away or um, necessarily even in particular threat. Um, and I, I think well, I, just, I would say that, I mean, this is where we need to study the military. The fact of nuclear weapons changes everything. Mm -hmm. The fact that you can annihilate people with very little manpower is an enormous shift in the history of war. Uh, and so that is just a fundamental, I mean, this is an argument in IR. I mean, I think nuclear stuff changes everything. Uh, people argue that because there, were, there hasn't been a nuclear war or there hasn't been nuclear weapons dropped in, in, in sort of aggressions in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, that um that that means that they don't matter i think they structure the whole thing uh and so i think that completely changes everything yeah um i've actually often you know even talked to you know more radical leftists about about revolution i would just throw a christopher lash article from 60 years ago almost now um so people uh, who who support revolution what do they say but what's the argument the argument is, you know, it, it, we need an insurrection revolution to throw a government. And all I just say is nuclear weapons exist. Well, and they're like, I, well, they won't I, drop I, them on their own people. And I'm like, they would test them on their own people. I don't know why they wouldn't drop them. <laughs> like, yeah, but beyond nuclear weapons, I mean, how the hell do, how does one take on the U.S. military? What's it, what is, what's the strategy behind that? I have no idea. Um, I, I don't even entertain such ideas because it just seems so. You know, occasionally you hear people bring up fifth generation warfare if they've read some of the right wing stuff. But even then, they haven't really read it because um, fifth generation warfare really only applies in a positive way if you're an occupied force, not if yeah. you're fighting within the home turf. There's also you have two generations of people not fighting in the military. Yeah, I mean, that too. I, 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 uh, something tells me that Americans aren't on the verge of sacrificing themselves for <laughs> ideal. I always find that argument curious. I always have. Uh, it just, just does not. It does not. I mean, to me, the number one rule of Marxism is being aware of your historical conditions and constraints, and that argument to me doesn't deal with that those at all. Me neither. Um, it, it's it's something I find kind of. Oh, it's not wrote, even laughable. Uh, tactical nukes. T yeah, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's 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 one of those things where. It was hard to imagine people doing it before nukes, honestly, because if you look at the developed militaries, the insurrections. Look at the bonus. Really, right. I mean, like, yeah. I mean, the, the, the state has an incredible amount of power, an incredible amount of power, especially now. Um, is there anything you think people should uh, should focus in on in closing and any final points you'd like to make? Yeah, absolutely. They should focus on subscribing to the American Prestige podcast, uh, debuting on Friday. Uh, if you want, you could buy my book. It's called Democracy in Exile. Um, yeah, I mean that's pretty much it. Um, I'm happy to answer any more questions if you if you got any in these last ten minutes. If not, we could peace out. Okay. Um, so. Is there anything you were talking about imperialist realism, the analogy to capitalist realism, with Mark Fister? Is there what are the things you think that are different about imperialism from capitalist realism? What what conceptions do you have to approach differently? People How is Fisher not helpful? People f don't even feel like they're in an empire in a way that people feel like they live in capitalism. I think that's unique. When you were a British citizen, you felt like you belonged to an empire. 
right? The United States doesn't go around constructing monoliths to its imperial prowess like they did in Britain, France, Austro-Hungary, Ottoman Empire. It's a big difference. People feel like they live in capitalism. People feel crushed by the capitalist system in a, in a, in a, in a felt emotional way. Um, which is why I think you do see more opposition to capitalism. I don't think that's true for imperialism. I don't think people feel like they're part of imperialism in the same way, and that's a big difference. Um, why do you think that is? Like, why has imperialism seemed to be much more invisible and and well, you know, the way the it's felt? I would say the way imperialism is mostly felt is through the ridiculous. <laughs> offensive consumption of the United States, which, uh, you know, has what, three to 4% of the world's population, forget the exact number, but consumes an incredible amount of things like the world's plastic, copper, blah, 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 blah. So the, the primary feeling of their imperialism is consumption and to be an American is to be a consumer. Uh, so I guess they feel it all the time. But they don't feel it in the negative way that one would imagine. We've created a global system where, where we are basically the final people eating out of the trough. Uh, and so I think that's a major reason. And, um, maybe something to think about as we as we think about china is china's real threat to u.s agenda is obviously not military if you look at the actual military capacities i mean um but as china far as can't the big thing with china is they just can't consume like american consume they have too many people that would mm -hmm. destroy the world even more quickly than the world is currently being destroyed so that's a big difference for the ccp they have a problem Mm -hmm. which is that the legitimacy is premised on basically constant growth. But one, repeating that growth on the level of China is not the same thing as doing it in the United States, which has, what, a third of the population. Uh, and plus, if they did repeat that growth, they would literally destroy the planet. That's a big problem uh, for China that uh, I think they're going to have to deal with in the coming years. I have been trying to point out to people who are perhaps overly rosy on China that their, um, their GDP growth and... Um, the general profitability rates have been in steady decline until COVID actually COVID knocked them back up just a tick um, from, but you know, over the past 15, 20 years between like 15, 10 to 15% down to between five and six, depending on where they are in the business cycle. Um, and that if you look at the United States, that was us in the 20th, in, in the beginning of the 20th century, they did it way faster than we did. Um, you know, and they've done it in a more controlled manner. And and and, and yes, there are also ways in which they are the the uh, the margins. The C, uh, the CCP is more is a little bit more able to indep act independently of its bourgeoisie. And occasionally, if someone steps too far out of line, they can, you know, execute them. But or put them in prison for a long time. But yeah, yeah but it's it's uh, it's pretty limited. Though, I mean, like, even that's pretty limited. And the only reason that it seems so much more than the United States is we don't do it at all. Um, right, right. So, wait, what's the argument people think, like, uh, the CCP is going to what exactly? Well, the, 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 because the CCP can occasionally take out a, you know, a Chinese billionaire that they, you know, are fully independent of capitalism. Um, no, and, people make that argument? No. I've heard it. Um, or at least they're, mo or that they will be independent of capitalism very soon. Let me rephrase. Let me that's say fantasy. it more that's, an American, that's fantasy. That's American fantasy. That's that, that is believing in aliens, uh, that, that, the, that the, the, the capitalism's transcendence is going to come through. I mean, maybe it, it, things will change in 50 or 70 years. There's just nothing that I, I could see that would, that would highlight that argument now. Um, why do you think that I ironically think American provincialism is why um, the, like any any vague argument like that about the CCP might have purchase is because people are pretty ignorant about what's going on outside of the United States, um, particularly in Asia um, and in Africa. Um, so. Um, but also, ironically, it's it's one of the interesting things about empires, right? People in the Imperial core tend to be pretty ignorant of things outside the Imperial core. Um, even though, yeah. Yeah. you know, even though they're involved in it indirectly all over the place. Um, and I think the only other way that people might see, they wouldn't think about it as imperialism. Um, how all the, how we've had real problems in global supply chains recently, both for, you know, 
material reasons due to COVID, but also for some political ones also due to COVID. But um, right, right, yeah, totally, yeah. Uh, I just think that's an incorrect reading of what's happening in the world. I mean, that that to me is like we're so weak that we're like literally like looking for God wherever <laughs> a glimmer of 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 them could be found. Yeah. Um, uh, our mutual friend, Jean Bajalan will, says this too, that people will do that with FDR, R with Xi Jinping, because it's a sign of projecting upon a historical figure hope when you've given up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's fake hope. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we're, things are bleak. Things are really bleak. Uh, and that's just the, the facts of the matter, as they say. Um, do we have any indication of where there might be new American imperial adventures? I think we're going to see actually fewer of those. I think we're going to see a, a turn to drone policing uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to boots on the ground and, and sort of random brush fire wars. That's my prediction of, of what will happen. All right. Um, well, I know you need to get out in about an hour, and I want to thank you for coming on today. Um, uh you people should read your book they should check out your podcast they should read your upcoming book that'll come out from zero i have no idea when but it is coming um on imperialist realism and uh any other place they should check uh that you write regularly they should check out your stuff i mean, i write regularly for jacobin um i'm a contributing editor there the new republic the nation i'm on twitter at uh, d bessner uh my first initial and my last name if anyone wants to follow all right. Thank you so much. Uh, and um, we are over and out. And I guess people should also check out, uh, uh, give them an argument, because they'll be talking about um, international politics there with Cuba and the aforementioned Jean Bajalon. All right. Thank you. Bye.